I want to welcome everybody to this evening's Mauer Report. Sorry for the slight delay here as we're getting started. A uh, little snafu of the guest. I should have texted him earlier, but we'll get to him here in a few minutes. Before we begin, the views and opinions of the Mauer Report are those of the host and guest and do not represent a sponsor, affiliate, uh, network, anybody else. Just having a good time here tonight. Looking forward to talking to our guest in a big way. So, um... I just got a text from him. He's almost ready. So we'll be ready for him here in a second. So now I was going to do this at the end of the show, but since uh, we're sliding things around because that's what we need to do right now, the 31st is the nine year anniversary of the show, which is a Sunday, I believe. Let me bring up the calendar again. It's not a Tuesday, right? We knew that. I knew that much. So what I'm going to do though, is I, I, I kind of just stumbled upon this idea last night starting friday in honor of nine years of the show starting friday the third the 21st because there will be a live show in there so i'm going to air nine replays plus the live show next week so it'll be 10 total shows nine at nine for nine so i'm going to at 9 p.m eastern i think i'm only going to do it exclusively on youtube i think it's going to be the jig i'm going to air nine of my favorite shows one a night through the course of the next nine, well, the, after that, nine days in a row there. I think it's my plan. Um, now, I haven't really picked the nine shows yet, so that's going to be interesting. But I think in one a night at 9 p.m. Eastern, we're going to start uh, rocking and rolling with the YouTube channel, doing them live and throwing it back to some of my favorite guests and some of the more uh, profound guests. I have not picked them yet. And this is going to be a problem for me, picking my nine favorite shows. So, um, but I'll, I'm making, I'll make sure that, uh, the YouTube chat is on and we'll be able to do that as well as we build through the nine shows. Like I said, I've got to sit down and get this done. And the worst part is I've only got a few days to kind of put them together in an order that makes sense. Uh, they're not going to be at a, um, one for nine, like the, the 31st is not going to be my favorite show, right? I'm not going to do that. That'd be ridiculous on my part, but because I can't pick my favorite show, right? That'd be like trying to pick your favorite show. But it's going to be hard. I mean, there's been 450 of these bad boys. And uh, there's probably about 400 of them recorded that are available for free on the website. So picking nine out of 400, I'll be honest, is going to be a little tough. Yeah, 12 hours. Good for him. I'm, you're lucky to get 60 minutes out of me. That's all I'll say. Do a Twitter poll. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm going to put one up to fans' choice. It'll probably be next Wednesday after the that show. Because I think we're going to start slow and work our way into it as the uh, the process goes. Um, I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm excited about a lot of things. Um, just if you've been following me on Twitter at Mallard, I think it was at Mallard today, I posted kind of a little a snippet of a... A board that makes no sense. It was getting painted green. I, I'm going to just leave it with some mystery, but be sure to be following my Twitter, uh, my personal Twitter, the show Twitter as well. I'm, there's a lot going on right now. Um, a lot of momentum headed in the summertime, which a lot of, I mean, I guess not as much as it used to. Back in the day when the show started, it used to be shows would just take the summer off. Right? But I was never that way. Actually, like I said, I started the show going into the summer, right? Which is counterintuitive to uh, most. So I'm just looking forward to the summer, building off the momentum we have. There's a lot of great momentum. A lot of, I mean, coming off guests like uh, Ben Melzerk last week and uh, the guest tonight. So, yeah, man, we're just kind of looking forward to it. A lot of great. Not, I don't want to go random numbers or Ouija board. Come on, guys. Now calm down. Um, but, I mean, I think there are some that I can say with confidence will be in there. Uh, I know one one of my favorites is Jim Mars, the late great Jim Mars, and I think that show has held up very well. Of course, I haven't listened to it recently, but I think that show has held up remarkably well. So we got that going for us. Um, there are so many others. I don't want to start mentioning ones because if I start mentioning them, I'll be over nine, and then somebody will be disappointed. So if you have not come over. Um, Sign up for the free newsletter at the bottom because that's where all these 
most of these details will be ending up. I'm going to send one out probably Thursday with, let's see, that'd be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, right? With those details kind of um, scattered through in them, maybe, if I can get that far in my head. A lot going on in the next few days. I'm not sure why I decided to do this, because I've got a personal schedule that's astronomical right now, but that's okay. I, I really want to do this because I think nine, I, I, I was going to just kind of blow it off and just kind of stare down the barrel at 10. But, um, after I thought about it, the more, the more closer it got, the more I realized that I need to pause and reflect on nine. I just can't push it aside and say 10 is the number. So I need, I need to do something. I need to do something grand on a grand stage, something I normally don't do. Right, uh, so we went with that. Okay. So there's all that. So come over and sign up for the newsletter if you haven't, because I, I, I get worried about a lot of things. Social media coming and going. I just worry, and if you're not signed up to the newsletter, you're going to miss a lot of things. Like I said, I just worry about how social media is developing, or de devolving is the word. So we'll see how it's all going. So there's all that. I feel like I'm missing something I wanted to tell you. Um, man, I've had to talk over and you forget something. Just... Just excited about... I mean, it's it's going to be a project for me. Nine shows over nine nights. Well, ten shows, right? Because I told you I was going to skip one in there and put the put a do a live show. So that's, that's going to be a, a stretch. So I hope you guys all tune in and enjoy these um, throwback looks at different shows and different eras and different guests. And I'm excited about it. Um, I know it doesn't sound like I'm excited about it because I realize the work that's going to go into it. But it'll be good to reflect upon these different shows and these parts of shows. And maybe, hopefully, all you guys will show up and um, be able to uh, enjoy them with me because I don't normally get to enjoy them with you the first time. So here we go, hopefully. Hello. Hello, Hello Ben. How are you doing tonight? Good, man. Good, man. How are you doing? Pretty good. So this is Ben Carey, guitarist for Elvis Monroe. Uh, I, I didn't write the whole list of bands that you played with down, but well known, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, I mean, we, we could fill them in. We, we could fill them in. in. I, I, I came to America with a band called Savage, Savage God. God. I was in, I was the, in the band, band Lighthouse for, for man, man, many, many, many years. years. Uh, I, played I played with an artist called Cal Buckman. I, uh, I, uh, I play with big country acts like Brett Young and Joe Nichols, Love and Theft. I also, also play, play guitar, guitar with my buddy's band, band Vertical Horizon, Horizon. and, uh, just, just to name a few. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> it sounds like you're busy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm si actually, <laughs> I'm sitting, sorry, sorry, I'm so late. late. I'm, I'm sitting in the studio, studio tracking, tracking guitars, guitars that i got to send off to a Australia for a gin rain. rain. And, um, and um, she's, she's got a single out right now called City Light Call. And, and uh, I'm working, working on, on you know, some tracks, tracks for her upcoming, upcoming uh, EP. I was going to say, I guess the music industry is kind of, I don't want to say adapted to this, but they were more adaptable to this, being able to record no matter where you are. This, uh, uh, yes, yes, yes and no. And no. I mean, it, it definitely, it's, it's a double-edged double sword, sword, I think, this whole thing. thing. Obviously, obviously, if you take, take obviously, the, the health, health, health risks and, and our, our families, families and friends' safety, safety out, out of the equation and, and speak, speak Completely on the work front. front. This, this has been, been extremely devastating to any, any uh, gig, gig worker, so to, so to speak. By that, by that I mean anyone, anyone involved in live shows, shows entertainment, and by, and by that, that trickles, trickles all, the all the way down, down to bartenders, bartenders and servers and people, people in your, in your local, local restaurants where, where people would musicians would play. Not, not only are the musicians out of work, work those bartenders and servers and everybody. It affects everybody, you know. The double-edged sword for musicians that are motivated is this, this is a chance where we don't, we don't have, have 75 shows this week, week and we are, we are forced, forced to be in the studio, studio and, and um and, and be, be creative, creative and try and, and i mean i, mean, I wouldn't say, say uh to stay, stay ahead, ahead of the curve, curve. that would be the wrong wrong way, wrong way of saying it, it but um 
just, 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 just be creative, creative and try and, try and come out with new music and try and stay, and stay relevant in a time, time where you can't be in front of people. people. You, know, you know, and, and, and I've personally, personally been using the time to, to, to really, really tuck into, into my programs, programs here, here and my guitars and my, and my songwriting and, and really, really make a head start, start on, on, the, on new the new album that was, that was yeah, it's been sitting there ready for a long time, just haven't had the time to do it. Now I'm forced happily into the studio minus all the other stuff that's going on in the world, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, like I said, I mean, I, I, I had a conversation a couple weeks ago about how TV looks in the fall, right? Because all that stuff's normally being recorded and produced now, right? From what, you know, because there's always this lead time that for movies and all this other stuff. So eventually this is going to catch us at some point with entertainment and... But at least, I mean, you're going to be able to record some stuff, so the music gap won't be nearly as, as big. Sure. sure. I mean, I mean it's... Like, like I said, I mean, we've, 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 we've had, had a new record, record on deck with Elvis Monroe, Monroe for quite a, quite a long time. time. I just, I just haven't had the time to go in and record, and record it, it because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very, it's very labor-intensive for me because, for me because, because I, I'm playing the majority, majority of the parts, I'm producing it, I've got to write it, and engineer it. It's a lot, a lot of hours sunk into every song, trying to fit that into everyday life as well as business, as well as being you know a family guy. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, um, now, I now I don't really, really you, know, you know, have a day-to-day, day, day, so, so it, this, way this way I can kind of just, just bury, bury my head in the studio, studio and, 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 and be, be as busy as I can. We've also been writing a lot in quarantine, quarantine as, well. as well. It's, it's just, just it's been an inspiring, inspiring time, time in many ways, you know, both good and bad, you know, but definitely for me, on a positive side, thinking about the work front, I'm going to be a better version of myself out the other side of this thing. So speaking of Elvis Monroe, that's how I came to... Well, I guess I've known your music, but I didn't know who you were. Uh, Kevin Harold uh, was out on the road with you guys yes, when yes. we were touring with Three Doors Down. He says hello and loves you, and I, I cool. Agree. And because he's been, he was a guest on my show. He was uh, pitching a paranormal show at one point, so that's how I got in contact with him years right, right. And years ago. So, um, so I, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned him because he's supposed to be listening, but if he's not, I'm gonna have to. Well, he's in San Diego, and I'm in Pennsylvania, so that's probably not gonna work. Uh, <laughs> We we, we, we got we got to out, out him. His name's, name's not, not really Kevin Howard. It's actually Sweater Vest. That's, that's his name. So, so, where, so, where so everybody, 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 let's, let's, let's tell that good story. Where did that come from? Because I think I've heard. Man, we got to get, 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 get on the record. So Kev came on tour with us, and one of the first days on the two of us, we had a night off. We were going to go out out on the town to a restaurant, you know, and he shows up in this god awful hideous sweater vest, and we're like. The hell, the hell is that, that thing? thing? <laughs> and so, so it, it was quite, quite a comical, a comical, uh, comical event. event. We, we, we definitely rubbed, rubbed it in his nose, nose so to speak, and, and, and um, but for, for he's forever, forever known as sweater vest. But we, but love, we him love him for it. it you know, you know we, love we love him for it. it. He, he's lovable most of the time. <laughs> that's, 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 that's true. That's true. That's true. So let's go back. Let's go way back. When did when did you pick up a guitar for the first time? Yeah, Man, I was just a, a little kid. kid. My um, actually, even, even prior, prior to the guitar, guitar my, my dad's mother had a, had a uh, piano, piano in the house. And when I was, when I was a little baby, baby, I used to sit on her knee and she played the piano. piano. She played, she played piano, piano in a dance band, band back, back, you know, way back, back in the day. day. And, my and my mom had a guitar, guitar laying around the house, a, 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 a classical, classical nylon, nylon string guitar, a gut string guitar, as some people like to call it. And I just picked it up and started tinkering around. And in 1986... I went, I went to, to uh, uh, I guess, um, um, it, was it was a shop, shop in Australia, Australia called, called The Trading, Trading Post, Post, which, which for, for one of a better word, for Americans, Americans would be known, known as a pawn shop, you know, you know and, and um, we, we, I, I don't know why we were there, but we went, we went in there, and I saw, I saw this electric guitar on an amplifier, and it, and it just blew, blew my mind, it looked so cool, and I negotiated with my parents to buy me the electric guitar and the amp in lieu of going going on a school camp, because it was the same money for this instrument as it was to go on the school camp. And, and uh, uh, I think like it was like 50, 50 bucks or something like that. And, and uh, they, they, they decided that would be cool, and they, and they bought me the guitar, guitar and I just, you know, you know, I just fell in love with the instrument. instrument. And then, and then uh, uh, in 1987, I, uh, I, uh, really I really tuck in and kind of kind studied, studied the guitar, guitar classical guitar, 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 I really liked technique, and, and didn't, and didn't really, really learn cool songs, songs. I just sort of learned learn about the mechanics of my left and right hand and how the guitar worked and functioned. And... I did, I did about three, three years of strict classical, classical guitar, guitar playing, playing, and then then I, then I was 
off of the, the races, you know, you know just, just learning stuff about albums and finding out what made me tick, what music, what music turned, turned me on, on what inspired, inspired me, what, what made, made me want to practice and be a better artist um, and a better, and a better guitar, guitar player. player. And, you know, you know from, from day one, as soon as I picked it up, I knew it's what I wanted to do with my life. You know, I wanted to be a musician, I wanted to be a guitar player. Uh, and, and it's, it's, it's just, just been a dream one. one. It still is, and I, you know, as as as, a, as, an, as an old dude now, now having toured the world many, 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 many times over, I'm very, very fortunate to have, to have had those experiences. All the, all the hard work paid off, off. but it's funny, it's funny that the more I do this, the harder I work. You know, the more I want to improve my skills and keep getting better every day. You know, I keep practicing, I keep working in 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 many many different facets of guitar playing, and and as a songwriter. That's a, That's different, a different skill set, too. too. So, so you've you kind of got to look, look at my role, my role as a guitar player within the band. What if, what if a band I'm playing with? Like, like what, is what is my role in my house? house? What, was what was my role in Savage, Savage Garden? Garden? What, what, what was my role stepping, stepping into a band, a band like Vertical Horizon or, or you know, getting, getting a call from Brad Young to jump on a plane and be somewhere within six hours and know ten songs? You know, every gig has its parameters and things that you have to... You have, you have to sort of have, have all this under your, your, under your thumb, thumb, so to speak, speak and, and, and pull it out, out of the bag of tricks when you need it. it. And, and um, um, that's, that's, that's kind of what I've been working, working on and continue to work on on a daily basis. So who were the early influences once you got out of that classic, classical guitar stage? Who, 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 was, the, who was the guy that really caught your eye? Uh, uh, the first guitar, guitar player of note that I fell in love with, there's actually two guitar players. A guy by the name of Eddie Van Halen, you might have heard of. And, and uh, uh, the, the, the album, album yeah, yeah, the album, the album 5150 in 1986 changed my life. Uh, my, uh, my cousin played, played it to me, and I was I went and bought the cassette tape with my, with my pocket money that I'd earned. And, and uh, I, I went to a, pr a pretty religious like church, church school, and we had, we had show and tell. And, tell and I got, I got up, up in front of the class, class and all the, all the kids, kids like little Sarah, Sarah was like, "Here's my bunny rabbit," you know. And Bobby's like, "Here's my tree that I grew today," and I'm like. Here's my, Here's my Van Halen tape. tape. And I, put and I put it in the, in the uh, tape, tape player and press, press play, and the teacher, the teacher couldn't rip it, rip it out of the wall fast, fast enough, and I got sent, sent to the office for listening to devil's, devil's music. music. You know, you know so, so I, I, I had a, a, rock, a rock start, start with rock and roll, roll as a kid, but I, I fell, fell in love with the sound, what the guitar made me feel like. And during that process, at almost exactly the same time, I discovered a band called Dire Straits, which... Mark, Mark Knopfler was the guitar player in that band. band. He's, he's his phrasing, phrasing and no choice, choice and feel was just second, second to none. none. And he was, he was a massive, massive influence on me as well. As well. And, and then, you know, you know I, I, I kind of from there grew into Eric, Eric Clapton. Clapton. You know, the, you know, the Journeyman Journey album was, was, was really, really amazing. And, and sort of my, sort of my early high school years, you know, you know I started falling in love with the Sunset Strip rock bands, you know, bands like Nelson and Def Leppard and... You know, you know Aerosmith. Aerosmith. I mean, Aerosmith. I mean, obviously, Def Leppard is not from the Sunset Strip, and neither is Aerosmith. But, but they, but they all, all, you know, you all hear stories about, about you know Motley Crue and Van Halen playing the whiskey and the Roxy and, 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 and LA, LA being the mecca of that. Of that, that, that what we, what we knew was heavy metal, metal, but it's really just rock music. music you know, great great pop songs played in a rock kind of way. And I fell in love with that. Then a band called Guns N' Roses came out and just took took over the world and. It, 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 it was just an amazing, an amazing time, time to be a guitar player, player you know, you know and, and, and grew up listening to those guys where guitar players were a very, a very integral, integral part, part of the band, band and they were in the forefront of music. And then, and then uh, uh, later, later on, on in life, life, I, you know, when, you know, when I got the gig with Savage God, you know, you know I, I was sort of presented with more of the, the bands, the bands that their crafts weren't so much about guitar playing, it was about songwriting. And that's sort of what I fell in love with over the last... You know, you know, 20, 20 years, years, you know, 20, 20 years, years of my development, development working, working on my songwriting, telling, telling a story, and, and what my role as a guitar player is within, within that songwriting, songwriting context. context. I, think I think the best guitar, guitar player I've, I've ever seen, and being, being around, around my, my favorite guitar, guitar player is a guy, is a guy called, uh, I, grew I grew up in Australia, and his name was Jack, Jack Jones. Jones. Or, or, and he you know, changed his name back to his original birth name later on in life called Earl and Thomas. He's probably the best guy I've ever seen play guitar. Uh, he's, uh, he's just phenomenal. phenomenal. There's, there's, there's many, many, many amazing players. players. He, was he was the guy, the guy that really caught my ear and eye. And, and he became a very good friend of mine and mentor. And, and, uh, and uh, there's a guy called Phil X who actually now plays in Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. Um, he, he has a band called Phil X and the Drills who's, who's, who's been, been, you know, you know, he's been, been a mentor and a friend and just a fantastic guitar player. Really, really great guy. I used to go watch him play little clubs in L.A. 
um, until, until he got, he got the call, call with Bon Jovi, Jovi and, you know, he's, 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 his life changed overnight with a, a, phone, a phone call and a jet flight, flight to a gig, gig learning songs on the plane, and, and, uh, and uh, now he's, you know, he's been in Richie Sambora's shoes for about 10 years now. So. so, take me back to Selvage Garden, because that became, like, the band you were first known for. How did that ride sure. start? Like, I mean... You've been playing for a while, and you're getting more and more. So the momentum's building. I was talking about the momentum of the show before you joined us. So, take me back through that because that has to be quite an experience going from small little places to all over the world. Yeah, you know, uh, Savage God. I was, you know, I had a dream of, you know, I hesitate to say I want to be a rock star because I don't literally mean it like that. But to to be a musician and tour the world and play to arenas every night. I think the best way to articulate it is to to say rock star, you know, a musician playing on a world-class level to thousands of people every night. That was my dream, and uh, I was following a path. I was working hard. I was in a band called Brill uh, back in Australia, which was made up of a, of a couple of guys from very big and successful Australian bands that were quite a bit older than me. I was the young guy in the band. And we were touring Australia, had a little van, um, and, and then... You know, someone had recommended me to Daniel Jones, who was in Savage Garden. Savage Garden had started having some radio success in Australia and were kind of blowing up. And uh, my phone rang one day and said, hey, it's Daniel, and we're looking for a guitar player. Are you interested? And I'm like, of course. And he said, can you learn these four songs and be on a plane tomorrow? And I'm like, absolutely. So uh, I, I jumped on a plane and flew to Brisbane, and we, we, we auditioned uh, in the basement of a house actually and um we played four songs and the singer darren hayes you know after the after the playing through the tunes we were sort of talking getting to know each other and he he asked me he said hey can you be a rock star and my answer to him was give me the gig and i'll show you and um my life changed the next day you know i got the phone call and and daniel said hey we really liked your your attitude we really like the way you play we think you'll be a cool hang and um, we we leave in a week, so pack your life up, and we're on the we're on the road. So I flew back to Melbourne and and put my life in storage and grabbed my guitars and jumped on a plane and 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 I'm still here doing it. You know, it's it was an amazing amazing experience. It, when they say things change overnight, you you spend your life preparing for an opportunity. And for any young guitar players that are listening, I always say the opportunity of a lifetime is only relevant during the lifetime of that opportunity. So you better be prepared. And my preparation for all these years with the belief that one day I was going to get an opportunity, I didn't want to blow that opportunity. So that phone rang and I actually, I was able to capitalize on that. And, and when, when my number was called, I, I was able to deliver. And, um, that's still to this day, it's, you know, the keys, to the kingdom, so to speak, is in the preparation and the hard work that nobody sees. You know, uh, you know, the hours and hours spent in a studio, in your bedroom, practicing, learning your craft, and then the hours and hours in front of people is another skill set you learn. And being on the road is not just about being a great guitar player. It's about being a good person and a great teammate and great band member. And, you know, you got an hour and a half on stage and 22 and a half hours off stage, so... You better be a cool hang and easy to get along with. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. Doesn't matter how great a musician you are. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, that's the thing because you can be the greatest musician ever, but if you if nobody likes you, you're not going to be out for long. Oh, exactly, exactly. That's that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. So okay, so you've you've kind of bridged this gap that I'm thinking about in my head, which doesn't really help you, but from the early early two thousands to today, which is a gap or needs a bridge over, but I, I think the the music obviously has changed. But how people are consuming music has changed too. That's easy for me to see. But how how has that changed what you do? It's changed in every way, you know, uh, and it continually changes. The internet, uh, but, you know, a lot of interviews we do, people ask how um, how the internet um, affects what we do as musicians. They like. And there's a lot of ways that it's a very positive thing. And um, there's a lot of ways that it's it's hugely detrimental as well. Um, 
the, the revenue side of music where we call it a job, like I support my family, my wife and my son by being a guitar player, you know, and if, if people can, can get my music and my talents for free, it makes it pretty hard to, to support a family, you know, and I don't really think the general public understand that a lot of times that all these years and years and years and years and sacrifices that we've made to be able to be good enough to play music that you actually like and maybe you want to buy. And when a lot of the streaming services provide it for free, it, it'd be like everybody going to work for free and having no income, you know, or just walking into a store and grabbing a pair of shoes and jeans off the rack that you like and not paying for it, you know? Um, so in that sense, the internet has been a, it's been a struggle for the music business because they, they didn't figure out how to monetize it very well at all. Um, leaving live shows sort of as our fallback, you know, the only way we can really, you know, you need millions and millions of spins on Spotify and iTunes to make even minimum wage, you know? Um, so it, it, it proves difficult, but on the other side of the coin, there's so many unbelievably talented artists that would never have got a chance to see the light of day or share their music with people. But now, have an opportunity because of the internet to reach the four corners of the globe and, and, and share their talents and, and, and possibly have a career of sorts, you know, whereas otherwise they'd just be like the most talented guy in their hometown that nobody's ever going to hear of, you know, um, for, for us with Elvis Monroe, we made a conscious decision at the start to be an independent act, an independent band. Um, that that was a tough decision and talk about climbing Mount Everest, you know, but it was, it was great because I've been part of, you know, major label bands for so long. It was, it was really nice to, to actually just go and make a record that I wanted to make without anybody's opinion, you know, just make music for the pure love of making music. And if people liked it, cool. And if they didn't, it, it wasn't the end of the world. It wasn't what I was basing my whole life on. I just wanted to make a record I was really proud of. Um, yeah, so, you know, like I said, both sides of the coin, it's positive and negative both ways. Well, I guess I should say at this point, you probably don't remember this, but I was at the Green Tree Pittsburgh show, was that two years ago? Um, right, with the one with three doors down, right? Yeah. I was the one that yep. brought Kevin that horrendous box of meat. You can swear at me now for doing it again. <laughs> yeah, thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did, I, I guess I learned something about you that day that you're, are you vegetarian? Oh, I am absolutely. Yeah, I've never, never eaten meat in my life. You know, Swedevest can eat as much as he wants, but I'm not going to tuck into it. So, hang on, hang on a sec, mate. I got to say bye to everybody real quick. Yeah, fancy. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll text you my. Actually, text me later tonight. We'll talk about the motors. Thanks, man. So I have a deep love of hot rods, and my, my, uh, my buddy, my mechanics, uh, finding a motor for a car for me. So oh, that that's important business. I, I'm not gonna absolutely. Get <laughs> Okay, so let's, let's, so speaking of Elvis Moreau, if if you're out there listening to this and have not heard any, what what what's the song I should, somebody should go listen to from them to kind of get them hooked into it? Wow, that's that's a really difficult question. You're asking some great questions. Um, let me think about that. I, here, here, let me sum it up like this. I think music depends on your mood, one hundred percent. There's music for any mood. Like if you're angry, you're happy, you're sad, tired, hyper. There's, there's music that caters for it. You know, you don't have to speak the language of the artist to understand and feel maybe what they're, they're talking about and what they're singing about. <clears throat> so I, I, I think um, I couldn't say a specific song because music is also a very subjective thing. Like, well, maybe it's, it's an art form, so I might, might really love this song, but maybe it's not your bag of wax you know um i'm honestly really proud of of every song we've put out with 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 elvis we haven't had the pressure of a major label pressuring us to put out you have to have this amount of songs and you have to have them out now so the songs that we weren't really that jazzed on we just didn't put them out <laughs> they never saw the light of day we never played them the ones that we put out are songs that we feel really strongly about and that They've, they've all got a story. You know, the one thing with, with Elvis Monroe is we're really proud to be songwriters that write 
from the heart, shoot from the hip, wear our hearts on our sleeves. We write about real stories, about real people, about real experiences that either we've been through or we can see other people going through things that we believe are worth singing about. Um, whether other people will not believe that, I, I don't know. They have to listen to our music. Um, you know, as far as a live band delivering a product, you know, we, we're fortunate enough to have an absolutely world-class band that, that it's, you know, it's a great show every time. It's a different show every time. It's a very interactive show. I, you know, there's not a ton of music out there available. So for the listeners, it's pretty easy to bump through some tracks and find whether they want to be an Elvis, you know, whether they want to join the Elvis Monroe Mafia. And uh, there's an album called Holy Water. There's a single called Colors That We Fly, another single called Fallen For You Bad. Um, and uh, the, and the, the rest is all on the Holy Water record, you know. So there's not a whole ton of body of work to wade through. It's not like there's six albums and you got to find your favorite song out of 100. You know, we're, we're working on our second album now. We have enough for another two albums. But again, we're probably just going to sift through the ones we really like and track them. We're, uh, we're going to be putting out a new song here in a couple of weeks called Be The Change. Um, really excited about that. We actually, it's a brand new song we wrote kind of about what the world's going through right now, something we can all relate to and uh, about doing our part to stand together and stand up strong as a, as the human race, you know, and help each other, love each other. And, um, I think it's a pretty banging little tune as well in amongst that. So a good message with a fun vibe behind it. That should hopefully be out in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. And I was going to say, going, going back a little bit, you mentioned really being in love with writing songs. I think all the Elvis Moreau songs that I've heard have been very well written, written better than I can speak. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I get tongue tied every five minutes, man. So good. <laughs> but I, I think if if you're going to listen to them, just go ahead and uh, listen to them, even if it isn't your cup of tea, music wise. I think you can at least appreciate the lyrics to them on the. the I, yeah, th I think uh, I think the thing. Sorry to cut you off, no. uh, but the the honesty in the band is it, it's a very transparent. You know, even if if you're not into specifically, you know, I guess we kind of fall in the the country marketplace, but we're a unique band in the sense that, you know, you saw us playing with Three Doors Down, we play with Daughtry, we play with Lifehouse, we play with Everclear, we play with Brett Young, we play with Joe Nichols, we play with Rand, every country act on the planet that's been on the radio, we've played with them. But we also kind of cross, cross over to the rock side of things. And, and I'm a big believer, if you strip down a song, and you undress, you know, you undress the song, so to speak, to give it a name. You're sitting down with an acoustic guitar just telling stories. That's really what the songs are about. What doesn't matter what genre you're in. Um, and that's really what we need to focus on, the songwriters. And that's what we do with Elvis. Like, I want to be able to sit down with my guitar or stand in front of you, you know, like you saw in, in uh, was it Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, you said? Um, yeah, when... We, we played as a trio, you know, two acoustic guitars and three voices. And we had 3,000 people on their feet. You know, that's that's honesty at its best. You know, if, if I can win you over with an acoustic guitar and some lyrics and melodies put in the right spot to speak, you know, to pull your heartstrings, I'm doing my job. You know, if I need all the production and I need all the band and all the lights and all the video, you know, I kind of feel at that point maybe people listen with their eyes, not their ears. And it really doesn't it doesn't sort of get to the art and craft of, of songwriting and telling a real story. Yeah, I was going to say, because sometimes you you hear something on the radio and then you go hear that that group, that band, whatever in person, you go, man, that is not the I, I think I got ripped off because the, the artist that I heard tonight was not what I heard on the CD. Right. Right. You know, we, we pride ourselves on tracking the record live. It's really us playing. It's really us singing. It's really us writing. And when we play live, I want it to be a, I want it to be a really accurate representation of the record. Or if we decide to deviate from it, it's a deviation on purpose. And you can feel that as an audience. Hey, oh, I really like what they're doing here. They're taking a left turn. We're not taking a left turn because we can't play the record. We're taking a left turn because we want to give the listener 
something else, a different experience at that point in time. You know, I feel like a live show is, we're not a TV box. We're not, sit, we're not put there to, for an audience to sit and stare at blankly. It's an interactive thing. Like if, if I'm, if I'm playing my guitar and, it, and I get the interaction from the audience, like I said, every show is different. You get a different feeling back from that collection of people every night. And it's a very unique thing. So, you know, special shows happen in all shapes and sizes. It doesn't necessarily have to be 50,000 people. It could be 10 people. It could be 100 people. It could be 5,000. could be could be whatever. It all just depends on the honesty in the room and that flow of, you know, the communication between us and, and them, you know. And, and then when that comes together, that's a special night, not only for the audience, but it's a special night for the artist as well. So I'm, I'm going to put words in your mouth for a second, and then you can probably kick me in the head here in a second when, if you don't agree. <laughs> um, because of all this, we're, we're probably going to come back to smaller shows, more intimate venues, smaller crowds, and all this other stuff. It sounds to me like you'd prefer you prefer the smaller, more interactive crowd kind of based activity. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I wouldn't say that. I, w I mean, I like any crowd. Um, it's it's a little more difficult for me to play in front of two or three people well, as no, opposed to a, a hundred, a hundred. No, no, but that's what I'm just saying to you that that me personally, as a guitar player and as an artist, I get really nervous when I'm in front of only a couple of people. But put me in front of a hundred and fifty thousand, and I'll rock your face off, you know. And it's it's funny that. Usually it's the opposite way around. People get intimidated by the amount of people. For me, that just motivates me. Uh, I get intimidated by by a couple of people, and not even just a couple of people. It's if there's people in the audience that really matter to my life, that that are the integral part of my my family and my life on a day to day basis. Those are the people that I really want to impress because those are the people that that mean the world to you. So if I'm playing in front of my lady, my son, or my parents, or, you know, people that I call my family, I don't really like to see where they are in the audience because I get nervous, you know, whereas if I'm playing to 10,000 people that I've never met, that I'm just meeting on stage, bring it on. It's a party. It's great. You know, <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense. But. I, I, I follow it to a degree. And then the other hand, I'm, I'm kind of, I feel that other, like, I'd be more nervous playing in front of a whole bunch of people that I don't know. So I, I follow it, but I don't, it's, it's weird right now. Yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of, it's, it's definitely inside out. I don't know why it is like that, but um, I've had some, you know, some shows that are like the largest show I've ever played was 550,000 people. And that was unbelievably cool. And then I've had intimate shows um, by, by a campfire in Yosemite with, you know, you know, to 50 people that I'll never, ever forget. You know, so it's it's not necessarily size based. It's 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 definitely got to do with the interaction with the audience and the band and what is happening, that special moment in time that comes and goes, but only the people that are there feel it. You know, so that's that's why I love live shows because you just never know what you're gonna get, you know? So I, I'm going to give you a chance to nerd out here for a second, but I've got to mention this. The guy who does all my uh, my writing, my uh, my show notes and all the good stuff, Chris, wanted me to mention that he lo he loves your Bigsby Les Paul. So, oh, yeah? Yeah, cool. So what, what what if you had to pick a guitar? Now, I know. How many guitars do you have? Do you have any idea? Uh, I think I got 90-something right now, so... So having, yeah, you, having having you pick one would probably be a problem then. Yeah, well, yes and no. I, I can answer that question pretty pretty easily. Um, I love all of my guitars. My the guitars are like kids to me. They all tell a story. I don't literally mean you know I can compare my guitar to my son, uh, but what I'm trying to convey to the listeners is the sentiment in each guitar means the world to me. It's tools of the trade. It's not just a guitar that you grab off the wall. It, each guitar has a story in it, has a feeling, songs in it. And uh, every guitar is different. You know, every piece of wood is a unique thing. And how it vibrates, how it resonates, how, how the electronics interact with that piece of wood, how old that piece of wood is, what that wood's been through, translates to the strings. You can feel that in your hands. 
and and it inspires how you play and what you do with that guitar. So, you know, the the easier way of saying that is sound inspires what comes out of the speakers. You know, so the sound of that guitar, also the feel of that guitar will dictate how I like to play it. Uh, like if you put on a pair of army boots, you're probably not going to want to go and do long jump, you know, or step on a basketball court. But if you put on you know, super supportive, more athletic than in work boots, you know, so it's the same with the guitar, you know, depending on the shape of the neck, the size of the strings, the amp you're playing through, your, your effects chain, it will all inspire what comes out and, and how it talks to your, your internals of, of what, how creative you are. So I don't really have a favorite, um, it really depends, you know, I pick the tool for the job. If I'm going to dig a hole, I'm probably not going to pick a spoon. I'll probably pick a shovel, you know. So it just depends on what I'm doing. Um, I'll, I'll grab the guitar that talks to me for that. I'll try many different things to see what sounds right. And um, I've been uh, really loving, um, it's kind of funny, I'm very old school with my amps and guitars. The older, the better and and stuff, but, but over the last 18 months, I've really dived into the technology world and there's a guitar called a Shuriken that I've, that I, I bought four of them because they just blew me away and they really are a really amazing, amazing tool. So I've been loving those guitars and, and I have a, a, uh, my, my, my amps have kind of gone to the wayside and I don't really use them anymore. I use a thing called a Helix that has been, completely life-changing for me because they're just so good and so portable and the technology in them is amazing i can sound like all my old amps and all my old guitars without having to risk taking them on the road you know um even making records now with with all the plugins and stuff they're just getting so fantastic that that if you if you got good ears and you really know what you're doing you, no one's going to know that it's not a real tube amp with a real Les Paul plugged into it, you know, and I'm a big believer of not being so snobby about brands, just letting your ears be the snobs. If it sounds good, it is good. It doesn't really matter what's on the headstock or what's on the speaker grill. If it sounds good, it is good. And I just find the tools that work for me, you know, and I'm very, very fortunate to have amazing sponsors that have been with me my whole career, which have enabled me to have, you know, when I was starting out gear that I couldn't afford, gear that enabled me to have a career, Gibson Guitars, Line 6 and the Helix family, uh, Fishman um, for all my acoustic pickups and stuff like that, Ernie Ball, my string company, uh, Aston Microphones over in England is what we're using to track the record, Telefunk and Mike out of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's just, I'm just very fortunate to have the support of a lot of really great people. So this this question comes from the legend German, Germantown runner, one of my my favorite chatters in the world. What, what's your what's your thoughts about Glenn Campbell? Say that all again. Well, this this question comes from one of my chatters, Germantown runner. What are your thoughts about Glenn Campbell? In what in what in what way would you mean? As a, as a guitar player, musician overall, I, I mean I know that he impacted Keith Urban, another Australian deeply i was wondering how that came if right. it worked for you you know I, I i'd be uh i'd be lying if i said i was super aware of his playing you know um keith is actually an amazing guitar player and a total sweetheart of a human um i i really like him i really love his music uh he's a very studied entertainer a very studied guitar player very inspiring guitar player and he's an absolute superstar uh, so any of his influences, I think, would be absolutely worth looking into for any musician. Um, personally, for me, growing up in the backyard of Australia, um, I, I had I didn't have access to a lot of a lot of music and a lot of stuff. So it took took me. I was a late bloomer when it comes to you know a lot of really unbelievable musicians. A lot of interviews I did early on, people would ask me about them. I'd never even heard of them, you know. And they're like, what? you never heard of this guy? And I'm like, no, I really haven't, you know? Um, I think, I think Mike Campbell, I, I love Mike Campbell. He's definitely been an influence on, on my playing. I love what he does. Um, 
Yeah, so no, I don't really have too much to offer on Glenn Campbell. So, I, ha- I have to bring this up because of what it was. Now, we've we got to talk about the shooting. Now, sure. I'm just going to leave it that to you. You can address that however you want, but I'm just grateful that you're still here to start this whole conversation. That makes two of us, man. <laughs> the alternative <laughs> ain't too fun. Um, I, I, I mean, there's a million different ways we can talk about it. Um, let me first say I don't feel special at all. I was one of 23, 24,000 other people that has their own version of how this unrolled. You know, um, I'm super blessed and thankful. I'm luckier than 50, you know, there's 58 people who weren't as lucky as the other 24,000. Um, it's heartbreaking for their families and friends. You know, we, we were very, very active raising money for people affected by route 91. It was something that affected me and my family personally on a daily basis and still does from time to time. You know, it's something that will, will always be in your The scariest day of my life, for sure. Um, wasn't through any great design that, that, that we were able to get to safety, which is pure luck, you know. Uh, I'm really proud of the work we've done as a band. Uh them through their times to raise money i think we raised nearly four hundred thousand dollars you know in all the charity shows we did donated a hundred percent of that money to people that needed it families that needed it um thankful to be here uh we t- we took it on the chin and on october 2nd we wanted to take a step forwards i felt really sad for the people that are still living their life at october 2nd and they they haven't moved on in their life. And I say this very gently I, and sometimes I come across the wrong way, but I feel that's really disrespectful to the 58 that weren't as lucky as us to be stuck on that day. We, I mean, it's our duty as, as humans and as parents and, and partners and friends and mates and lovers. And we, we, we gotta, we gotta stand up and fight. We gotta take another step forward and, we got to be the best person we can be because every day is, you know, tomorrow's not guaranteed. And uh, I'm thankful for today. I got to live it to its fullest, and then tomorrow we'll tackle tomorrow when it gets here. Well, I, I guess you, you you glossed over something that needs mentioned that you literally carry this with you. You've got a scar on your arm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something <laughs> I, you know, we I, I didn't really publicize too much. I, you know, talk about it from time to time. Um, I got zipped on the elbow and it, it could have been life changing for me if it's a millimeter to the left, you know, and maybe not be able to play guitar anymore. Or maybe I wouldn't be here. Maybe I would have bled out or who knows. Um, like I said, it nothing's guaranteed. So f- for me, I kind of, it's funny. I kind of pinch at that el- elbow occasionally. And it's just a little reminder to, to not just, just, respect what we've got you know and be thankful for what we've got and and live it to its fullest and 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 during this covid thing you know it's been a wake-up call for me to not just get buried in in work and shows and guitars and music and you know like i i have have an amazing son and wife and family and friends and sometimes they end up with the you know the ass end of the deal so to speak because we got you know we travel so much we're so busy and which is our families. You know, I, I'm not fortunate enough to have my family in America. They're in Australia and I can't travel to see them. So, um, you know, this has really been, I wouldn't say a wake up call, but it's definitely been something that's got my attention that I really want to try and continue on this path a little bit, a little bit stronger once we get on the other side. So I, I normally avoid the modern conspiracy, right? I'll talk about JFK, right. the moon landing, and all this other stuff, but you're here. So I have to ask you, when you hear these random theories out there, having been in the arena, quote-unquote, in the moment, how does that make you feel? Talking about uh, Route 91 specifically or COVID-19? Yeah. Well, the the Route 91 specifically, I guess. <laughs> right, right. Um that's a tough one, man. Um, 
I'm 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 pretty good with sound. So, you know, I I know what I heard. Can't really say what I saw. Um, is going through that kind of trauma um, and stress, it does funny things, you know. Um, and until you've been through it, you really don't understand how your body reacts or even what's happening at the time. And sound is my life. Um, cadence, I don't know if you know what, the, what a cadence is. It's, it's a rhythmic pattern. Um there's definitely more than one rhythmic pattern happening and an and a, and a automatic weapon provides a rhythmic pattern when it's being shot. You know, the caliber of bullet provides a sonic feature that is unmistakable, you know, um, there was something happening, I, you know, within very close succession of each other. Could I say where they were coming from or anyone could say where they were coming from immediately? Absolutely not. It just was craziness. Um, do I think it was that guy? Maybe not. Do I have any evidence to back it up? And other than conspiracy theory, not really. You know, I just know what it felt like, what I saw, and sort of what I read about in the aftermath. But again, I kind of, I put it all behind me. That day they happened and we came out the other side, and, and I don't want to think on it too much. I kind of move forward, not backwards. You know, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. No, that's why I, that's why I kind of saved it here for the end because I didn't want to have it hanging over the whole conversation either. Um, but I, I had to bring it. <laughs> I mean, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, man. Like I said, I we wrote a song called The Fight. It's it's actually not um, it's not on iTunes or Spotify yet, but I would urge people to get on uh, YouTube. Sweater Vest, Kevin, who we talked about earlier, actually cut together a really great video and you'll be pleased to know the version that you can listen to to the video on YouTube is actually recorded live at the show you were at that night. So the footage we shot was at that show in Pennsylvania. Um, the audio is from that show too. It's completely live as we played it. Um, and I'm really proud of that song. And that song is not about Route 91, but it is about what happens to us out the other side and what we need to do as people and as humans. So I, I believe it's relevant to all of us, and I'd love people to check it out. Yeah, actually, I was hanging out with Kevin on the bus for a few minutes after the sh after the show, after Free Door to Stone was done. He was cutting it then, which was kind of cool to watch and then see it later. Yeah, yeah. So. If 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 you if you have a a web link to your show, maybe you could you could post that link for people to check out. That would be yeah. really cool. I'll do that. Um, if not, if not, it's the fight by Elvis Monroe and. Uh, you know, it's got some really great footage in there. It's, it's a really honest song that means the world to Brian and I. And speaking and speaking of Slaughter Vest, he his favorite Elvis Monroe song is Rebel. Oh yeah, cool. I love that song too. Yeah, it's a cool song. I wrote that song on a uh, on a um, actually a guitar made out of uh, a Winchester ammunitions box from the 1900s that had a neck put on it, which was cut out of floorboards out of a house from Hurricane Katrina and it had a banjo resonator stuck. It was like this kind of bits and pieces, bastardized sort of guitar thing that I was playing with Lifehouse for a little while on a song called Between the Raindrops. And uh, we were doing a New Year's Eve special in Las Vegas and I was standing on stage noodling on this thing in between takes and um, I wrote that riff. Later that night, we were in the Frank Sinatra suite at the Golden Nugget, and we were like, man, we got to write a song. we got to channel Frank in here somehow, and Rebel came out, you know? <laughs> it's remarkable. Okay, so you mentioned Hot Rods earlier. I know you're... you're yeah, uh, man. So tell me tell me what you got. Tell me what you're, what's like... Okay, not what you got. Well, maybe what you got and what, what the dream one would be. How's that sound? Okay, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to own my dream cars, a 65 Shelby Cobra. And uh, since I was a little kid, that was my dream car, and it still is. I love that beast. Uh, I have a 64 Caddy Coupe de Ville, and um, we're just in the process of uh, of putting a new motor and tranny in that thing, um, trying to decide which way to go. I'm going to be a little untraditional, and, and I'm probably going to end up going with a like a big block Chevy or something in that that I can get a, a lot of grunt. I think eventually I'm going to maybe tub it and pro street it and do something fun with it. And right now it's just a cruiser. It's 
pretty pretty badass car though. Um, I have a friend up in Oregon that builds cars called Resurrected Rust, and he has a he has a uh, a really cool nineteen uh, nineteen twenty seven uh, rat rod that that he's built that he's holding. For me. I uh, look forward to getting hold of it at some point soon, and um, I want to build a uh, you know where my my studio is actually inside of a hot rod shop, and we build a car called a Super Cat. And uh, we take 68, 69, and 70 B-body chargers and resto-mod them, putting in the Hellcat motor and tech and drivetrain and suspension. And, and uh, you know, we make a real stout, uh, modernized muscle car with a real 60 serial number, you know. So I want to build a, probably a 69 um, charger with, with a blown Hellcat motor in it and, and stuff uh, on it. The way I want to do it, I want to really make it aggressive, and, and I want to do a thing called a stealth cat. That's going to be my 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 next project. You know, well, weren't charges aggressive enough, man? <laughs> Wait till you see ours. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can check it out at supercar super supercatcars dot com. Uh, we're building the new website as as we as we speak, and car number one's being built. Uh, we got two on the rack, and and it's yeah, one of them's old school. We got a five twelve stroker in it. And uh, and then one of them has the, the the new Hellcat motor and blower, and it's it's pretty stout, man. It's going to be about nine hundred horsepower. A lot of fun. Oh, good job! Reminded me of my my question I need to ask you: Where can people find you and find find uh, well, you know, all the promo stuff, all the social media, and all that? Yeah, stuff. yeah. So we're on Instagram and Facebook, Elvis Monroe official. Uh, me personally, you can check out Ben Carey Music, and um, this, you know, if you like like cars and hot rods. I have a company called Petrolhead, which is petrolheadapparel.com, and um, I'm on Instagram also, and then uh, supercatcars.com. If you know that that's coming soon, that that should be in the next few months, where we'll reveal the website and and sort of what we're doing with that. You say you're busy, right? What, what do you? I, I I don't want to ask this question this way, but I guess you know between the music and building cars, so. What is there? Is there? There's. Is what do you do for fun? I mean, it sounds like you're just ha- living the dream every day. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I love my family time with my, with my wife and son. Uh, we just took an RV trip a couple of weeks ago up into Zion and Bryce Canyon, and you know, turning off the world, turning off our, our mobile phones, and just sitting by the river and doing hikes and spending quality time. I love that. I'm a massive basketball fan. I love playing basketball. And um, and then Harley's and Hot Rods, man. You know, and also, I mean, playing guitar is pretty fun too. So yeah, I'm I'm definitely very lucky. You know, <laughs> playing guitar is pretty fun too. I like that. That's probably the line of the interview right there. Yeah, playing playing guitar is pretty fun too. I gotta say, yeah. Well, Ben, I'm glad we finally got hooked up. I'm glad I finally remembered to actually ask you while we had a little bit because I tried to track you down before. And you, you, you were a little busier then, but we'll, you'll get back to that. So I'm glad we got this together now. You know what? It's it's not even a case of being busy. It's just a case of being social media challenged. I didn't even see your message. I spo- luckily spo- stumbled. <laughs> you're spo- you're I'm so bad at yes. it. I don't. <laughs> yeah. I. I. But I. You know, I'm not going to lie. You know, it's, it's like I'm just terrible at checking Messenger and. You know, I, I get messages like two years later from people. They're like, hey, I'm visiting Vegas. And it was like 2016. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> so, so, so you're like back in Australia and have done three other world tours since then. But um, I'm, I'm trying to get better with it. I, 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 I definitely dropped the ball with the social media thing. I'm, I'm, I'm now actually on Cameo. I started a Cameo um, uh, profile. So if any of the listeners would love me to... You know, give him a shout out. Um, check me out, Ben Carrier at uh, a cameo, and you know I can show him, you know, very intimately how to play some of the songs, you know, from the bands I've been in. You know, give favorite birthday shout outs to Auntie Liz. You know, <laughs> whatever, whatever. Maybe maybe you don't want to break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend. I can do it for you. So there you go. <laughs> Well, Ben, it has been outstanding, and uh, when 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 you get back to Pittsburgh, we'll hook up again. I have the phone number now. So Sounds I'll, good, I'll mate. Call you. you do. <laughs> That's, te- 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 text me is a hundred percent success rate. You know, so if if I don't respond pretty quickly from a text, I didn't get it, so hit me back again. You got it now, man. Great talking to you. Thank you for the time, and I hope the listeners enjoyed it and check out our stuff. Well, thank you for the time, and have a good evening.
Take care, man. Bye-bye. Ben Carey, Elvis Monroe. Go check out their music. Like I said, very strong, very, very strong music. I, uh, I enjoy it greatly. Mallard.com. I'm telling you, here we go. Here we go. Getting ready here. Last few, few, few weeks before we start year nine. Here we go. Just blown away. Good stuff right now, man. Can't even tell you. <laughs> 